death from any cause, death from cardiovascular disease, death from cancer, death from all remaining causes. And we're seeing the higher the omega-3 level, the lower the risk of death. But the omega-3s are protective across a wide variety of uh, outcomes, which all manifest at the end of the day and lower risk for, for dying. Welcome to the CMLAN Podcast. Today, our guest is Dr. William Harris. Dr. Harris is one of the world's leading experts on the health benefits of omega-3 fatty acids. He has a PhD in human nutrition from the University of Minnesota, and he has authored over 300 publications on fatty acids, omega-3s, and fish oil. Dr. Harris, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm happy to speak with you. And uh, you've you've done a lot of research about omega-3s and uh, you're very well known in a space. So I'm happy to discuss with you about all things omega-3s because, you know, I think like fish oil and core liver oil were one of the first supplements that I, as a child, knew about in terms of right. like, okay, these things have health benefits. And I always like to say that even like, you know, even your grandma knows that uh, fish oil or like omega-3s are good for you or that they have health benefits. So, right. uh, so uh, yeah, I guess we, we can start like, you know, it, it, this knowledge has been around for like decades. We can start with like, okay, what's the understanding about the health benefits of omega-3s, you know, now in the early 2020s? And yeah, well, I we, thank you for mentioning grandmothers. Um, back in the day when kids used to be given cod liver oil, boy, it went back into the easily in the 1940s um, and before. They didn't know anything about omega-3. Mm. <clears throat> they knew cod liver oil was good for vitamins A and D, and that's why they gave them. Uh, they didn't realize they were also giving the benefit of the omega-3s, which were discovered some 20 years, 30 years later. Mm. Um, so anyway, there was an upside. Uh, it still tasted rotten, but, you know, that's part of being a kid, I guess. You, right. you got to suffer through that. Um, so where we are today, 2024, um, on the health benefits of omega-3, they are, uh, a, as you know, and as you've talked to your your um, audience before, there are many uh, Stretching from cardiovascular disease, uh, which is a large field, um, <clears throat> and endothelial, the, the, the health of the blood vessels throughout the body. Um, we've looked at uh, risk for death. We, we do a lot of studies nowadays looking at blood levels of omega-3 and how they relate to future disease outcomes. And so we've been looking at uh, the, the big one, dead. Uh, death from any cause, death from cardiovascular disease, death from cancer, death from all remaining causes. And uh, we're seeing the higher the omega-3 level, the lower the risk of death. Uh, of course, everybody dies eventually. So you you, you, you got to <clears throat> say risk for death in a window of time, you know, certain between this time and that time, between this age and that age. Hmm. Uh, but the omega threes are protective across a wide variety of uh, outcomes, which all manifest at the end of the day in lower risk for for dying. Uh, cognitive benefits we we're seeing uh, again people with the higher omega three levels are lower risk for developing dementia, uh, which is a big deal these days, um, and uh, just a variety of other diseases. So high omega three is really good for about every system you can think of. Mm, right and uh w why is that so like so as i you know understand then some of these omega-3s they're not necessarily considered essential um or they're more like conditionally essential uh but uh like what are some of the like uh, reasons why you see such yeah like a consistent finding that you know people who have higher blood omega-3 levels uh, they have lower risk of you know heart disease and mortality so what are like I guess the mechanisms that uh, give those uh, effects. Right. And, and that's, that's always the next question down. Um, you know, I suppose we should define omega-3 when, when I'm talking about omega-3, I mean, the long chain marine derived EPA, DHA, those marine, <clears throat> excuse me, those omega-3s, uh, not so much the plant ALA, uh, which probably is the essential omega-3 fatty acid, EPA and DHA, are, as you suggested, conditionally essential, meaning they're nutrients that you don't have to have in your diet to live and reproduce, but they are nutrients that 
when in the diet at higher levels, give you better health outcomes. Uh, it's a little bit different than the classic meaning of essentiality in nutrition, where where if you haven't got it, you, you're dead. Right. Um, and that's not the case. If you haven't got it in your diet, you're dead. Yeah, because we can make EPA and DHA to some extent and probably to a, a sufficient extent to allow you to live and reproduce. And and the best evidence of that is simply looking at cultures that are vegetarian or vegan, where they consume no EPA and DHA preformed, but they consume ALA and they are still with us. So um, anyway, just to clarify, EPA and DHA really are uh, give additional health benefits when they're higher levels, uh, but they are not considered classically essential. Uh, what's their mechanism of action? That's it's probably easiest to boil that down into anti-inflammatory. If we want to pick one one mechanism, uh, there are others because the omega threes uh, have an interesting effect on heart rate, for example. Uh, they actually lower the resting heart rate a couple of beats a minute um, hmm. because wow. they affect the they affect the autonomic nervous system, the balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, which drives your heart rate. Um, and you know, if 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 people are allotted a certain number of heartbeats per life, and you slow down the heart rate, uh, you see how you might extend your life. Uh, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but the 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 effect on heart rate uh, is kind of underappreciated and is not probably driven by any inflammatory or anti-inflammatory effect. It's more about how the cells respond to the sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, input to the tissues. So that that's another part of the mechanism, I think. Um, they lower triglyceride levels, uh, which has been known for many years uh, when in high doses. Doses of two, three, four grams a day of EPA and DHA. Um, that's not probably the, the primary mechanism by which most people derive benefit from omega-3, though. Two primary lipids. We talk about what's your lipid levels. We're talking about triglycerides and cholesterol. Mm. And within the cholesterol family, we're talking about, you know, the good cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, LDL, low-density lipoproteins, high-density lipoproteins, uh, and the omega-3s. <clears throat> don't really lower the the LDL, which is considered the the, the bad particle. Um, they can have a little effect on raising the good particle, but we don't really know if that's part of their beneficial effect or not. Mm. So the heart disease uh, risk reduction comes down to most of the anti-inflammatory effects and lowering triglycerides and endothelial effects on the blood vessels. Right. Endothelial effects on, on blood vessels, relaxing them. The blood vessels are, are a little more relaxed. They're not as stiff. Uh, reduced risk for hypertension, uh, which is one of the major risk factors, of course, for heart disease. So mm. they, they, play, they play a pretty deep role in biology. Um, down in the cell membrane is where a lot of the action happens, which is hard to, for people to picture sometimes, I, which I understand. Um, but the cell membrane is an extremely important uh, part of the cell. We think of the nucleus and the DNA and all that stuff is really important, but the cell membrane is what determines what goes in and what goes out. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> just like at your house, if the trash builds up inside the house, it's a mess and that can happen in a cell too. So the omega-3s help <clears throat> move things in and move things out appropriately. I want to take a quick break to let you know that you can now get my new book, The Longevity Leap, on Amazon. It contains 24 chapters ranging from the biology of aging to all the major chronic diseases such as heart disease, kidney disease, neurodegeneration, and I also cover over 70 clinically relevant biomarkers for chronic diseases and their optimal ranges. You can get the book from the link in the description. Well, even if it's not considered essential, it still has so many like, you know, health benefits that you would you would be foolish not to like, you know, consume it or uh, not consider it uh, quote unquote yeah. essential in that sense, because yeah. yeah. I think a good term for it is bioactive. Right. They, are, they are active biologically and that's important, but there are a lot of molecules that are bioactive that are not necessarily essential nutrients, mm. uh, which is a, a, maybe a fine line for some people. But um, yeah. when you're, when you're trained in nutrition, you learn to think about those words in, in, that light. Mm, gotcha. So, uh, yeah, 
you also you mentioned this uh, omega three levels in the blood, which mm -hmm. which I think is you know called omega three index, and right. you've been also one of the pioneers in uh, I guess popularizing this this uh, biomarker. So um, yeah, can you talk about what it is and what does it reflect? And uh, yeah, what's like is there any like optimal levels for it and how do you measure it? Sure. Oh, a lot of good questions. Yeah, the omega-3 index is a a metric or a blood test that we developed about 20 years ago now. And we originally proposed that the omega-3 index was a risk factor for death from heart disease in the same sense that high cholesterol is a risk factor, high blood pressure is a risk factor. We said high, a low omega-3 is also a risk factor and that people should be measuring it. So we came up with this thing called the omega-3 index, which is the amount of EPA and DHA, and the sum of those two, in red blood cell membranes. So the red blood cell, of course, is the easiest cell to get a sample of. It's in your blood, obviously. <clears throat> so any, any blood sample is going to collect red blood cells. And they are, when we analyze the membranes of the fatty acids, uh, the membrane fatty acids in red cells, we can create a ratio of EPA and DHA to all the other fatty acids. And that's, so that's a percent. So the omega-3 index is expressed as a percent of the total fatty acids in a red cell membrane that are EPA and DHA. And it typically ranges from a low of maybe 3% in very low, um, 3.5%. We see that in vegans. Uh, up to uh, Japanese, uh, older Japanese people eating very traditional diets of 9, 10%. Uh, so that's the range, 3 to 10. To, we, we, we like to think that the optimal range is between 8% and 12%. Somewhere in that range is, is really optimal. Uh, the average level in the U.S. and Europe is roughly 5, 5.5 maybe. Mm. Um and then again, as I mentioned, uh, cultures that eat very little fish have very little, very low levels under 4%. So uh, that's the range of the omega-3 index. Uh, it's a test that's, that we can run on a dried blood spot. So people can prick their finger at home, put a drop of blood on a card and mail it to the laboratory. And then we'll give them back the, uh, the their omega-3 index and a variety of other fatty acid measures. Uh, we get from the blood. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. So I, I I like to yeah like, or it's 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 fortunate to have like a biomarker for you know a supplement or like a a food that you're like eating because most supplements you don't know if it's gonna work. You know you take whatever supplement that's out there like, I guess like you know these other popular anti aging supplements like resveratrol or NMN or something like you know you could measure yeah like your NAD levels and see if it works but but uh, most other supplements don't have a specific biomarker to track okay are you in the optimal range and uh, if it's working whereas with omega threes you actually have you know a biomarker that you can track relatively easily and uh, see okay how do you pair up with uh, you know what we know is associated with like reduced risk of mortality and what's uh, better for uh, overall longevity right right that's that's i think the the real value of the omega-3 index is that it's a very well documented and validated biomarker of your omega-3 status which mm. is largely driven by how much epa and dha you eat uh but not not 100 percent uh there's certain some there's some biological variability underneath it because you do synthesize a little bit of it um yourself but uh and there's probably differences in the individual people's rate of absorption when they take an omega-3 supplement or they eat a piece of fish that's got omega-3. I'm sure there are genetic factors that there's a long chain of events from mouth to cells uh, mm -hmm. that are mediated by lots and lots of different proteins. And um, there are undoubtedly genetic differences in how people respond in terms of the omega-3 index to a omega-3 supplement. So, right. To your point, if you only want, if you want to know what your level is in your situation, you measure the omega-3 index. And if you're low, you increase your omega-3 intake and the index will go up. Mm. Is there any risk for this like healthy user bias with this uh, marker? So um, what I'm saying is like, you know, if you generally eat, uh, you know, 
non-westernized diet or like you eat less junk food and you exercise a little bit more uh, is do you have would, would you have like a better omega-3 index result which would you know then i guess uh, make it less well, caused by yeah. the omega-3 index i'm just playing like devil's advocate because yeah some of some of the like other markers like you know if you just are healthier overall then your biomarkers will be generally better and uh, if you what i'm asking is again the like does the omega-3 index is it only affected by your omega-3 intake or is it affected by like other like healthy lifestyle habits as well uh, not that we know of not really uh it's it's driven by i mean the, the the question that you're asking is a good one and it's one that comes up a lot in uh research where we're looking at omega-3 levels predicting certain disease outcomes and people will say well having a high omega-3 that's just a, a marker of a healthier diet so it really is the healthy diet not the omega-3 that's doing the action that's actually the mechanism well i don't think that's true uh we've we've adjusted many of our analyses we adjust for healthy lifestyle we adjust for the intake of other nutrients we adjust for exercise we adjust for smoking alcohol intake uh all these things body mass index things like that um and still the omega-3s are predictive so it's not they're not operating via these other healthy lifestyle factors um, and so, you, yeah, you can eat a very healthy lifestyle. And if you don't eat any more omega-3 than you're eating in a crappy lifestyle, your omega-3 index is not going to be higher. Mm. Yeah, like I've I've seen that from my own uh, example as well, that, you know, you know, so I've, you know, never been kind of overweight or anything like that. I've been healthy pretty much for, you know, 10 years or something. And I measured my omega-3 index first time, like over a year ago. and. Uh, it was something like maybe 6.6 6 or something like that, which, you know, isn't like inherently bad or it's not, it's not very bad, <laughs> but it's, it's not, not like, bad, the no. it's not in the optimal range uh, either. So I started taking like larger amounts of these omega-3 supplements, whereas in the past, I actually haven't taken them, you know, regularly and it got up to a uh, 9%, uh, so, which is, you know, more optimal from yeah. what we know so yeah like That's the only difference i or the biggest change i did make was just increase the omega-3 intake whereas you know my other lifestyle factors were pretty much uh, the same as, as before yeah yeah that's a very common story mm. but it's, it's a right... very, very simple story i mean it's you know exactly what to do if right. your omega-3 index is low you, you just eat more yeah very simple. but is there like how far do the benefits go like uh so you mentioned that you know eight to twelve percent is kind of the upper end, um, and I would imagine that yeah, Japanese people might have you know ten, twelve percent. So is there because you know when I've looked at uh, some of the studies, then then uh, I I didn't find a lot of like uh, studies about uh, twelve percent and the health benefits. So so like do people who have twelve percent do they already have? Uh, lower risk of mortality even compared to people who have eight uh, percent and ten percent or yeah. is it like does it peak at eight percent to the benefits it's a great question so do you really to kind of max out it so say say you're at ten percent do you get any better benefit of being at 15. Mm. Uh, short answer is we don't know because there are <clears throat> you know count them on one hand how many people in this world have omega-3 levels that are that high uh, very little study has been done of those people. So we even up to 12% is very, very uncommon. Um, actually, oh, just over 8%, uh, maybe 95% of Americans and Europeans are, are below that 8% target. So asking what's going on at 12% or 15% is, is a question that's not, it's not beyond potential research, but it's there's no research that I know of at this point that shows that you get even more. I think you're you get diminishing benefits, <clears throat> diminishing returns, as they say. There's a point beyond which more omega three is not going to help. You you've done all you can do in that regard. Um, that would be true for any nutrient. Mm, gotcha. So if somebody is like you know eight percent, mm. then uh, they can feel pretty good <laughs> about they it. Can feel uh, pretty good. Yeah. Now there there is one study from Japan that uh, we looked at some years ago where they looked within a Jap you know basically looked between eight, ten, eleven, twelve percent uh, in a, a cohort of older Japanese, and there was a actual reduced risk for 
some cardiovascular outcomes in people who are 11% on average compared to 8%. So I, I think there is, I think it's, again, it's a diminishing return. You get most of the bang for your buck going from 5% to 7 or 8%. And then you get a little bit more, a little, little bit more each additional, prep, but, but it isn't much. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and yeah, like, you know, if it, well, at, at least like with a supplement, it doesn't require that much effort. So, you know, whereas with exercise, you, you see the similar thing that, okay, you get most of the benefits by just going from sedentary to some physical activity and, uh, and, uh, doing a bit more than that, but, you know, being a very like pro athlete already starts giving diminishing returns. Whereas with the omega threes, I would imagine just taking a supplement, you might increase the dose or something. It might it might be like it doesn't require extra effort in that sense. You might just yeah. have to take a double dose or <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and there's and as far as we know, there's really no no substantive risk to health from having an omega three index of eight, nine, ten percent. Right. So that's that's a good thing to it. Yeah. Uh, but what about the opposite on the lower end? So yeah, if you have three to four percent, then um, yeah. what does it mean? Essentially, well, that, that, that's always the place you don't want to be. <clears throat> when we do these studies comparing the highest levels to the lowest levels, the lowest levels are always around that three and a half or four percent. Those are the people that have the worst outcomes, whether it's total mortality, whether it's uh, cardiovascular mortality, whether it's dementia. Uh, any of these outcomes are worse. We always compare to the lowest level, and the lowest level is always worse off of anybody. Uh, so that's definitely where you don't want to be. Mm. And uh, how mu how much of that effect is because you know people who have lower omega three index they are generally on a, like a worse diet. Well, again, we 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 do our best to control for that to to say this is independent of all these other factors. Uh, <clears throat> so statistically, you can do that. Whether it, it you never it's never perfect. Uh, the best way to do it was with a, of course, a randomized controlled trial, but nobody's going to do a randomized controlled trial with a placebo in, in people and, and give it to them for 20 years mm. and see, you know, oh, does this help? Because some of these studies that will conclude that omega-3s don't work are maybe four or five years long, and they started when people in their mid-60s. And so to conclude that omega-3s don't work for A, B, or C, whatever outcome you're talking about, is uh, is an incorrect statement. I mean, it's, it's correct in the context in which it's made, but that context is always lost. The context is, okay, maybe one gram a day of omega-3 doesn't help if you're 65 years old, you've already got heart disease, you've already got diabetes, and we're going to see what it does in four years. That's and right. it, it, it doesn't change your health. Like, well, okay, no surprise, okay? But that doesn't mean writ large omega threes don't help in in decades of of life where you keep your omega three index high and you never develop these diseases. Um, that's the important point. We're not treating omega threes as a drug. We're treating them as nutrients. Right. Yeah, like you would just always be better with a uh, eight <laughs> percent. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I mean, the Japanese on average. Uh, live about four and a half years more than Americans do. Um, and they have the higher, you know, omega-3 index is roughly 80 to 90% higher than the Amer average American. Mm -hmm. Now, is that the only reason? I can't say that's the only reason they live longer. Uh, but it's interesting to think because the Japanese also know, are known to have higher uh, rates of blood pressure, higher high mm -hmm. blood pressure. They smoke more, they're under more stress, and yet they live longer. Oh, really? Well, wow. yeah. So is it the omega-3s? Well, I think omega-3s are at least part of the story. Mm. And Europeans as well. Like, I do know that Europeans smoke a lot more than Americans, but I didn't know the Japanese smoke as well. Yeah. More than yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, Mediterranean diet is pretty uh, high in fish as well. Well, it certainly can be. It does. There are versions of the, uh, there are so many versions of the Mediterranean diet. It's, it's, it's a little hard to say exactly what diet that is, but <clears throat> yeah, you're right. In general, you would think that fish would be high in the Mediterranean diet. Yeah. But what about, you know, if a person is generally healthy, like, you know, they exercise, they're lean, they don't have blood pressure and diabetes, those things, uh, 
but they have an omega-3 index of 6% or, you know, 4 or 5%. Uh, you know, I guess the answer is still that they would be better off by having it at 8%. <laughs> but is there like any, stu any, any studies about uh, what do, 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 what's, the, what's those people's uh, risk profile? Yeah, um, we're just starting a study right now um, in looking at the health risk in a group of, of vegans, of vegetarians, of pescatarians, which pescatarians are people that are vegetarian, except that the only meat they eat is fish. Mm -hmm. And then what we call omnivores, you know, people who eat anything. Um, and the omega-3 index goes, the, the, it's the lowest in the vegans, next the lowest in the vegetarians, uh, next in the omnivores and is highest in the pescatarians, which makes perfect sense. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at uh, long-term outcomes. So the, the, the question you're kind of asking, the question we're interested in too, is let's say you're eating a vegan diet and you're you're healthy in a lot of ways. Your 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 body weight is normal. You exercise well. Um, you have low blood pressure. Uh, is that enough to protect you from dementia, cardiovascular disease when you get older? Or do you still need higher omega three to protect you? Mm. We really don't know. Yeah, that would be interesting to find yeah. those results. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, how do you then increase? The, uh, we know the optimal level to you know you know what to you what to measure and what's the optimal level. So how do you uh, increase it? So like first, is it possible to reach an omega three index of eight percent with uh, just diet? And uh, if you do supplement, then like what are some of the doses? Uh, yeah, people use. Yeah, it's answer first question. Yes, it's possible to do it with diet alone. Um, if you just ate. Uh, oily fish like salmon or or mackerel, herring, sardines, uh, albacore tuna, all these types of fish that are high in omega three. If you uh, had you know one serving a day, uh, that would definitely give you. It would probably give you on the average of about a, a gram, gram and a half of EPA and DHA per day, which would put you in the. And that's what we've seen in general to move from a four percent omega three index to eight percent on average takes about 1500 milligrams of EPA DHA. Uh, and so that can be done with supplements that could be done with fish or a combination. So it's, it's very achievable. It just doesn't take heroic measures to get uh, up to 8%. Mm -hmm. And uh, 1500 milligrams per day. So how of EPA much... DHA, not, not of fish oil. Right. Right. <laughs> Right. How, mm -hmm. how much? How much are you getting from, let's say, a hundred grams of, uh, you know, salmon or something like that? Oh, you're getting roughly a gram, thousand milligrams. Okay. So that's not that even, much. Yeah. Well, it depends on the obviously a lot of things. Uh, <clears throat> salmon used to be uh, farm salmon, which is more and more the most common, uh, used to have higher omega three. Now it's down to again a gram, a gram and a half per serving. Uh, because they're switching out fish oil in the food for salmon for other oils. Uh, still, salmon is still a very good choice. Uh, <clears throat> just because it used to be better doesn't mean it's not good now. Yeah. And uh, from the supplemental sources, then, yeah, like the EPA, DHA combined, 1,500 milligrams per day. Right, right. And we like to we like to recommend both of them together because they come that way always together in nature. Mm. Um, some people want to just take DHA or just EPA, and I don't really recommend that. Um, I don't think that's the optimal way to go uh, from a nutritional point of view. Do these uh, EPA and DHA, do they have like distinct effects on the body, like, or do they have synergistic effects? Or Pretty synergistic. Uh, when, they, when people have studied EPA alone or DHA alone <clears throat> at the same dose, same grams per day in the same people. Actually, DHA is probably a little bit better as an anti-inflammatory and a lipid lowering, triglyceride lowering agent. Um, it's it's not a huge difference, but it tends to be a little better than EPA. But EPA is good too. So gotcha. I think together is what you really need to look at. <clears throat> mm. Yeah. And uh, if you are taking supplements, then... There are like a few different types out there. You know, there's fish oil, cod liver oil. 
even like some of the plant-based ones, uh, algae oil, you have uh, krill oil as well. So, uh, yeah, like, are they all equal in terms of uh, raising your omega-3 index and like the health effects uh, or there, or do they have like different, different uh, like uh, effects? Yeah. The, and you mentioned cod liver oil and fish oil. Those both are triglyceride based or the, the, the omega threes are contained in, in we call triglycerides or molecules that have three fatty acids per molecule. One of which is usually omega three. Uh, those oils are the best absorbed. There's also a lot of supplements now that are called restructured, tri or re <clears throat> re-esterified triglycerides. Uh, they are more concentrated in omega-3, but they're, the omega-3s are still in the uh, chemical form of a triglyceride. And those are the best absorbed. Uh, omega-3s in, in phospholipids, like in krill oil, are also very well absorbed. Uh, it's the, the one that's not so well absorbed is an ethyl ester uh, omega threes, which is what the pharmaceutical products are, mm. uh, Vesepa and in the U.S. Loveza, Omicor, and the, and the rest of the world. Those are ethyl ester products. Uh, it's not that they're not good; they're fine, uh, but they just need to be. They're best taken with food, so you have some uh, food in your stomach and in your intestine that will stimulate all the absorptions, all the all the systems for absorbing fat um, are, st are stimulated after a meal. And that's what you need to absorb the ethyl esters. Mm, right. So the triglycerides, triglyceride form is the best. And I think uh, it's the best, the best form. Right. Mm -hmm. how, how does one know which uh, type of uh, supplement it is? Well, it's a good question. Uh, usually it'll say somewhere on the label. Uh, if it's an ethyl ester, it'll say it. If it's if it's a krill oil based product, it's going to have it's going to be phospholipid based, phospholipid and some triglycerides, kind of a mix. And it's krill oil is, is less refined <clears throat> in a sense. Uh, it's a more of a mixture of lots of different chemical forms. Um, and if it's a restructured triglyceride, who the the producer because it costs more money to actually produce that product that takes more chem more chemistry uh they're going to be charging a higher price typically than the standard fish oil and they'll want to put on their label you know this is a re re-esterified triglyceride or restructured uh highly concentrated triglyceride so that should be on the label gotcha. <clears throat> you've also heard uh, you know a lot of talk about these uh fish oil <laughs> and omega-3 supplements being uh rancid and um, oxidized because they're yeah, like these polyunsaturated fats with uh, very um, vulnerable bonds. So, like, what what do you think about that? Like, uh, I know there's much of it. I I don't think that there's. I think people are really trying very hard to uh, scare consumers into buying a higher purity product when the standard products are not going to hurt anybody. They're not. They're not so oxidized or so rancid or anything that it's going to cause any adverse health effect. Uh, the omega threes and even the cheapest, what we call an eighteen twelve product, a thirty percent omega three, uh, those products still raise the omega three index just fine. You just need to take more pills. It's just lower concentration of omega three per capsule. But I'm not worried about um, all the hype about about uh, <clears throat> oxidized or rancid. I, I think that's and it's true that the omega threes are what we call highly polyunsaturated, meaning lot, they have lots of double bonds in the molecule. But that doesn't, in, in 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 a test tube, they will oxidize pretty quickly. But you're you're not putting them in a test tube; you're putting them in your body, mm. and your body has a myriad of antioxidant systems to protect um, these important double bonds. And, and so those in vivo. In your life, in your body, the omega threes are not susceptible, not not highly susceptible to oxidation, uh, any more than other fats. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I actually see, yeah, like one study from 2012, like a randomized controlled trial, where they gave this highly oxidized fish oil for a week, and uh, it didn't change inflammation status, uh, but it did raise the omega three <laughs> index. So yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, like you know that. <clears throat> even if it's like super oxidized the fish oil it doesn't appear to in the short term at least you know cause inflammation in the body and if you look at the you know broader amount of evidence then 
you know, omega threes are pretty known to just be anti-inflammatory in a lot of uh, clinical trials. Right. <clears throat> right. Yeah, but you you would you know generally still want to opt for like the best product that you can like afford and what you think oh, yeah. would be uh, mm. let's say most suitable for you. So like. Uh, uh, yeah, like what are your like recommendations if someone is looking for a okay? Well, I wanna try to get omega threes as a supplement. I wanna try to increase my omega three index. So, uh, what are some best practices from like a uh, yeah choosing the best uh, product? Um, I guess my advice would be look for a triglyceride based product. <clears throat> look for a product that gives you <clears throat> excuse me uh, somewhere five hundred to seven hundred milligrams of EPA DHA per capsule not per serving sometimes per sometimes the fish oil manufacturer will define a serving and they'll define it as two or even three capsules and they'll put how much omega-3 is in that serving um, but you need to look at how much is in each capsule so if you're aiming for five to seven hundred milligrams VPA DHA per capsule that's that's a very good product um, and so, and there are several out there that are like that. Mm. Gotcha. And uh, you wouldn't like care that much about the form, the triglyceride or ethyl ester or, um, or also, yeah, like if it's contaminated with like heavy metals or anything like that. Yeah. Heavy metals are not a problem for fish oils because the heavy metals are, are found typically associated with proteins. Uh, not with lipids. So when you extract the lipids or the fats from fish or from fish or from uh, cod, like liver oils, things like that, you leave all the heavy metals behind and the lipids go over here. It's like water and oil don't mix. Okay. And the heavy metals tend to be in the water part. Uh, so I, I'm not concerned about heavy metals at all in, in fish oil supplements. Gotcha. Right. What about fish in general then if you're eating fish from the sea? Yeah, I mean that's that's a more complicated question. Um, I think people have been far more concerned about mercury than it needs to be. Um, we've <clears throat> uh, people are, are are very scared, or the, of course, some people like like to scare people. Some agencies enjoy this um, by getting giving you the idea that all fish is contaminated with mercury. It's not true. There's maybe four or five different species that are um, relatively high in mercury that pregnant women should avoid uh, and babies. <clears throat> but in general, uh, most of the uh, salmon, mackerel, herring, sardines are all very, very low in, in uh, mercury. And the studies we've done, we've looked at uh, a, a wide variety of meta-analysis of studies that looked at fish intake reported fish intake in pregnant women all, all around the world, 20, 30, 40 different studies. And then they looked at the uh, outcome for their children, mental health outcomes for their kids, like IQ, things like that. And we found that the, across the board, the more fish the mom ate, regardless of how much mercury was in the fish, regardless of how much mercury was in the fish, the higher the fish intake, the better the cognitive outcome for the baby. So it's mercury does not uh, counteract the beneficial effects of omega three, and it's mm. it's 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 I think it's just way overplayed how much fear people are in. I mean, pregnant women are the people are the ones that should be eating fish, if anybody, and they're scared away from it by uh, these concerns about mercury that I think again are overblown. Mm. Yeah, I guess yeah. You know, fortunately, you can also measure your heavy metals from the blood if you're uh, concerned with with you that. Can. Right, yeah. right, <clears throat> right. Uh, what do you think about algae oil? So uh, I've seen that it also oh, yeah. is effective in raising EPA and DHA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, algae oil is is it's a triglyceride. Ultimately, it's it's algae uh, for certain specific species of micro one one celled unicellular. Algae, not seaweed. We're not talking about seaweed. This is about uh, uh, s very small microalgae uh, that will make naturally make EPA and DHA, um, and those are isolated. Then they they grow them uh, in big vats or big po open ponds anyway, 
uh, isolate the oils from them and sell it as an algal oil. And it's fine. Um, that's pretty much what fish eat. Uh, it's more expensive because it's a lot more work. Uh, but there's nothing. It's, they're very good sources of omega-3. Mm. Yeah, so vegans should definitely take algae oil. <laughs> yeah, and B12. <laughs> mm. Yeah. The other standard uh, vitamin that's uh, found just in animal products. Yeah. Um, maybe we can uh, talk a little bit more specifically about um, you know, some, some of these uh, various chronic diseases that have been seen to benefit from omega-3s. So like heart disease, obviously, is one of the you know, leading killers in the world. Mm -hmm. Right, and mm -hmm. uh, there has been yeah, like a pretty long history of you know fish consumption being linked to lower risk of heart disease, as well as uh, these uh, clinical trials on uh, omega three supplements as well. So uh, yeah, like how effective is or like how effective is yeah omega threes both from like the dietary source as well as supplemental source uh, for um, I guess uh, for for people who have or who are like of like who want to prevent heart disease and also if they already have you know some some elevated risk factors yeah um yeah it's, it's hard to put a number on it um <clears throat> we certainly see that risk for death from cardiovascular disease is about 20 percent lower in people who have a well actually 35 percent lower from one of our studies uh, at one meta-analysis, 35% lower risk for dying from heart disease uh, if you got an omega-3 index over 8 compared to under 4. Uh, so, you know, what does that turn into? What's your absolute risk? Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember absolute risk. Um, relative risk is what we like, like to talk about. When I say 35% lower, it's all things, all else being equal. The people who have the higher omega threes are at lower risk, um, but it, it's important to look at absolute risk too. Um, and absolute is really what 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 are your chances of dying of heart disease? Well, it's probably probably one in four people will die of heart disease. Um, how many people will die prematurely of heart disease in the sense of like in their fifties or sixties? You know, maybe one in twenty, one in thirty. Uh, those are absolute risk values, and uh, the omega three reduces both absolute and percent risk, relative risk. Uh, but it's 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 a little hard to put a specific number on, particularly you know fish eating versus non fish eating. Um, that's a little more complex because when you're eating fish, it's, there's other things you're not eating, and it is is it just the benefit of the eating the fish, or is it the benefit of not eating? what you would otherwise have been eating instead of fish. Uh, those two factors play together and are both, both good for your health. Um, but it's, it, it's much clearer to look at omega-3 supplement studies and in the, you know, still the meta analyses, when you look at all the data over all the last 40 years, uh, omega-3 supplement use still is associated with lower risk for death and cardiovascular, lower cardi lower MI rates. Um, lower total mortality. So all, all of that's still good. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah, like, uh, so the effects have, you know, anti-inflammatory, reduces triglycerides, and endothelial uh, function support. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. Uh, what about, I think I've even seen like that smokers who uh, have a higher omega-3 index, they have a lower risk of death uh yeah. if they have a higher omega-3 index yeah you know we, we we published that in framingham a large observational study in the u.s we found that people who were the most at risk for death so between age of 65 and 75 take mm. that window of time uh, people at most risk for death uh, were the people were the people who reported smoking and had a low omega-3 index like three or four percent uh, the people who are the least likely to die in that window are the people that did not smoke and had the highest omega-3 index, which makes mm. sense also. And then if you were one of those crossover people, you smoked, but you had a high omega-3, or you didn't smoke and you had low omega-3, they were in the middle. Uh, their risk was was uh, 
not as bad as the smokers with the low omega-3 and not as good as the ones who had the high omega-3 and didn't smoke. So that all makes sense. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that omega-3, if you're a smoker, you can take omega-3 and erase the effects of smoking. Um, I wouldn't want to propose that. I think it's obviously far better to quit smoking. Um, but at the end of the day, if you can, if you can get your omega-3 up, it's going to help, even if you're a smoker. Mm. Right. And the do is there like a higher dose for people who have heart disease or is it uh, the same? Um, you mean, do they need a higher dose to get a yeah. same omega-3 index? Not necessarily. Uh -uh. Uh, not, not for the omega-3 index, but for like, uh, um, what, it's like if they take a higher dose, do they have a lower risk uh, compared to like a lower dose? Uh, you know, yes. Uh, again, nobody has done that kind of study where mm -hmm. you actually give, you know, two or three or four different doses of omega-3 to people and look at the, that would be a, that would be a very long, hard, expensive study to do. Um, typically you get omega-3 or nothing or a placebo and right. not a, there's no dose response studies. Um, we do know there's dose response on the omega-3 index, the higher the dose, again, it, it, it levels off after a while. There's a point beyond which you really don't get much more Im impact on the omega-3 index once you're up to probably four or five grams a day, which hardly anybody takes. Yeah. Uh, what, what about uh, like uh, Alzheimer's and neurodegeneration? So omega-3s are very important for the brain as well. And there is a link between higher omega-3 mm -hmm. index and reduced risk of dementias. Right. So um, yeah, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's an interesting story because it also brings in another nutrient, um, basically B vitamins. Because if you're low in B vitamins, uh, folic acid, B12, B6, um, you tend to have a higher level of, of another chemical in your blood called homocysteine. And high homocysteine is also a risk factor for dementia. And people have seen in a couple different studies that omega-3s will lower risk for dementia if you have a low homocysteine. If you've got a high homocysteine, the omega-3s don't work. Mm. So you really need a good nutrition in, on your, your B vitamins and the omega-3 to get the, the total benefit. Gotcha. <coughs> and uh, do you like people who have already like some aspects of neurodegeneration would supplementing omega threes like alleviate any of those uh, symptoms, or um, would it like probably guess, not? Uh, probably not. No, I, I that's very. It's very tough to turn back dementia. Mm, it's just more like preventive side. It's prevention. We're talking about prevention here. Yeah. Right. Makes sense. Um, right. So uh, another, you know, essential fatty acid as well or essential fatty acids for you know overall health and it's considered essential are like omega-6 fatty acids and uh, they also like have interesting story with uh, omega-3s so uh yeah you you hear a lot that okay omega-6s are bad for you and omega-3s are good for you and you always need to eat more omega-3s and less omega-6s so uh yeah what's the story That's the there? story <laughs> i don't believe it <laughs> <laughs> i think the uh Studies we've done and many other people have done with the, the primary omega-6 fatty acid in the diet is called linoleic acid. It's an 18-carbon, mm. two-double bond omega-6 fatty acid. It's It constitutes roughly 50% of, of like corn oil or soybean oil would contain roughly 50% linoleic acid. Um, it's And it is uh, unquestionably an essential fatty acid in the real sense of the word. Um, and so we we really need linoleic acid. The, the argument is how much do you need? Uh, and it's true that there is some competition between the omega-6 pathway and the omega-3 pathway. But at the end of the day, if you actually look at the relationship between blood levels of omega-6 fatty acid, linoleic acid. So if you just measure the linoleic acid levels in the blood, it varies across people. We've looked at that recently um, and just published a study on that and looking at the, the people with the highest blood levels of linoleic acid, meaning the highest intakes, 
in the long run because you can't make it. You can only eat it. So people who have the highest levels in their blood are the people that have greatest intake. They are uh, significantly lower risk for total more uh, death from anything, death from total more uh, uh, total or from cardiovascular disease or cancer. Um, and again, that was just published. Uh, it's, it's being published right now, and and that's a study we did in the UK Biobank in about two hundred fifty thousand people, where uh, we we knew the omega six levels, the linoleic acid levels, and. This is just confirming what's been seen by other people in other settings, because um, we had done a study uh, in collaboration with uh, 20 or 30 other groups uh, looking at omega-6 linoleic acid levels in many, many different studies and pooling it all together, not just doing it in one cohort like the UK Biobank, but all around the world. Same hmm. story. The higher the linoleic acid levels in the blood, the lower the risk for cardiovascular disease and lower the risk for diabetes, uh, mm. which is very interesting. So I I don't buy the uh, linoleic acid is bad for you story. I don't buy the omega six omega three ratio as a being a meaningful metric for anybody, whether it's uh, in your food or in your blood. Uh, I think the the problem with most most people in the West is they haven't got enough omega three. It's not an omega-6 problem. It's an omega-3 problem. And so to get distracted and thinking you can contract, you you can uh, reduce your risk for these bad diseases by fixing your ratio, by eating less omega-6, that's going to be counterproductive. It's going to increase your risk for these adverse outcomes based on the studies we've done. Mm. Um, what you need to do if you want to correct your bad ratio is to take EPA and DHA. Mm. That will correct your ratio, uh, but that's the right way to do it. And right. that's why I think we like the omega-3 index is about EPA and DHA. It's not about omega-6 fatty acids because gotcha. what's missing is EPA and DHA. It's the linoleic acid of the omega-6 is not something you need to worry about. Mm. So, that, yeah, that's very interesting because, you know, I would imagine most people's biggest dietary source of omega-6 fats are, you know, processed food, I would imagine. So yeah. like I don't think you know most people are eating cold press cold pressed uh, canola oil or <laughs> some nuts and seeds and yeah. those things. So yeah. like yeah, how do you like reconcile that? Because or did oh, you well, control for that? You, you, you can't blame the omega sixes for the adverse effects on health of processed foods. Right, right. I mean, there's other problems with processed foods, uh, and what it, basically what you're not eating uh, is part of the problem. But just because Omega-6 fatty acids are in processed foods doesn't mean the omega-6 fatty acids are harmful. Mm. In right. fact, it looks like they're helpful. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I'm not advocating eating lots of processed foods. I mean, I don't have to advocate people do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. You know, but it, to the extent that a diet high in processed food is harmful, and I think there's good evidence that it is, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the omega-6 fatty acids that are doing it or even contributing to it mm. yeah I, I'm, I'm what i mean is that you know if, if they found in a study that higher linoleic acid in the blood and i think it's also in they found that in the adipose tissue uh, people who have higher linoleic acid they have a lower risk of mortality but you know right. because most people get the linoleic acid from processed food so how how how, how can that result uh well make sense <laughs> oh well it it, it it makes sense because if if people were eating processed foods without the linoleic acid, they'd be even worse off. Mm. Okay. So the omega the omega six in the processed food is one of the good things that they're getting from their processed foods. Um, they're but it, and it's counteracting whatever the other things, the bad things, whatever they are, um, which are dragging you down. The omega sixes, I think, are lifting you up, so that mm. at the end of the day, you get a mixed effect. Um, it, it's it's best, of course, to eat a healthy diet and to get omega sixes from, uh, like seeds, nuts, and, and I don't mean olive oil and canola oil because they're very low in omega six. Nowadays, safflower and sunflower are very very low in omega six. In order to get rid of trans fats, people have gotten created low omega six oils, which, when hydrogenated, produce less trans fats, and 
that's a good thing to get trans fats out of our oil supply. But if we do it at the at the expense of lowering our linoleic acid intakes, it may be a, a net no. It might not be a net good effect. Mm. Right. Um. Yeah. So, uh, is there any like amounts? Like we know the, the kind of approximate amounts for omega threes, and we have a marker to measure. So uh, with omega sixes, like, is there too much? Like, could you get too much? And uh, and what are like amounts to? You, you uh, probably. Could. I think the average uh, American or maybe European is eating about six to seven percent of their calories as linoleic acid. Most most health health organizations recommend somewhere between five and ten percent of your calories come from linoleic acid. Well, people don't know how to calculate that. You know, you know uh, that that's very difficult to do. So, you know, you look at how many grams of linoleic acid is that per day, and then for men, it's something like sixteen. For women, it's something like twelve uh, grams, and even that's hard to know where you're going to get that. Uh, there have been studies giving. 30, 40, 50 grams of omega-6 linoleic acid. And that's that's too high. There's no point in doing that. that. That's way beyond anybody's recommendations. And if there are adverse effects in diets like that, that's fine. I I agree. That's not anything like what's any being recommended. Going up to 10% of calories um, is probably the best place to be. We haven't, uh, we've thought about at OmegaQuant, which is the company we have that measures the, omega, the fatty acids. We thought about putting out a, 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 or making a linoleic acid index in a way, uh, because we think it's healthy. We, we think that uh, the evidence, a lot of evidence together, shows that people at the highest end of linoleic acid levels in their blood are doing better in the long run, health wise. Uh, so it makes sense to have a test for that. Um, we we keep running into this problem that you raised, is this, this unfortunate urban legend that linoleic acid is bad for you. Um, and so we're, we're still kind of dancing around whether it makes sense to offer this test because of the pushback of what I think is uninformed uh, crit critics. Um, could be un unpleasant. So anyway, that's that's ongoing discussions right yeah i think it's one of the uh problem of uh mechanisms versus you know outcomes that yeah mechanistically right. the the fish oil is oxidized and it can cause inflammation but in the real world uh, yeah like even the very oxidized fish oil doesn't cause inflammation in the human body um and i guess yeah with the linoleic acid as well it can get uh, something like that that you have same story yeah, mechanisms, yeah. and if you actually look at the outcomes, and then it's a bit of a different story. Because right, that, and that's the thing. When people will look at mechanisms. They'll look at in, inflammatory markers and things like that. What they're not looking at is a whole host of things they don't even know to look for. Yeah, it, it's a big black box in there. And if you measure five things that you know higher linoleic acids and maybe linked to five bad things, well, what about the FEP forty five other good things that you didn't measure? You don't know. You just don't know. So that's why we think looking at outcomes is the important question. Mm. Are you living or are you dying? Do you have disease or you do not? And we don't care about the mechanism at this point. At this point, we want to say it looks to me like the higher levels of these omega-3s and linoleic acid all point to a healthier, longer life. So let's do it. Mm. And we'll worry about mechanisms later, but we're not going to be able to really explain every every mechanism that the omega-3s or omega-6s are involved with because it's far too complicated. Yeah. But but uh, omega-3s are more important in that sense that most people no, are we're, we're missing. Right. We're, deficient we're, we're more deficient, we'll put it that way, far more deficient in the omega-3 EPA, DHA than we are in omega-6. Yeah, most people probably don't need to like <laughs> deliberately start increasing their omega-6. They're probably Most people don't. I, I think they should not intentionally reduce their omega-6 mm. but whether that means intentionally increase it probably not uh as you say most people are in in kind of that five to ten percent of energy level which is which is good the big problem for them is the lack of epa and dha mm. 
Yeah. And don't, don't get distracted on the omega-6 side when the real problem is the omega-3. Gotcha. And there's also like omega-9 uh, out there. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. What's, is there any research about that? Well, omega-9 fatty acids are, you know, a lot of it in our diet. Oleic acid is the name of the primary one. Um, but we make that. We can synthesize that from sugar or from protein. Or um, There's no, no dietary necessity for the omega-9 fatty acids. Mm, okay, gotcha. I've seen, like, in some of the, I guess, food products they have made with high oleic uh, whatever oil, so um, right right and uh even like if i'm not mistaken then the oleic acid actually increases the antioxidant uh if uh, like antioxidant potential of the oil so like high oleic acid olive oil is more protected against oxidation and uh heat and those things if I'm no not mistaken. And, and that's fine uh that uh, what, what's missing there is the fact that it's high oleic uh, means it's low linoleic, low omega-6. So yeah. whether that makes it a good oil or bad, I think is debatable gotcha. in the long run. Right. Yeah, and, and olive oil as well. We can talk a little bit about olive oil. It's not directly related to omega-3s or anything, but uh, yeah, it's also one of the fats that's you know very commonly linked to lower risk of heart disease and mortality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm not, you know, th that is debatable. Um, but that's probably beyond what we want to talk about today. Um, and w whether it's the omega-9 fatty acids in olive oil, there's very little omega-6, or the 50 other compounds that are carried along in olive oil that are beneficial. We don't know. I mean, I'm not, olive oil is fine. It's a good thing to take. Uh, but we don't know exactly which are the, you know, there's polyphenols that are in the oil or not. Maybe that's what's beneficial about it, not not a fatty acid, more other com compounds. So okay. it's dangerous to be labeling one food healthy without knowing all the components that you're talking about. Mm, yeah. Right. Um, while we're talking about, uh, yeah, like the uh, inflammation or like the yeah, protecting against oxidation, so like storing omega-3s, we should mention that about as well. Like, you know, you should, store it ideally like in a fridge right no you don't have to um it, it doesn't hurt to store it in the fridge by any means but the the gelatin capsules that encapsulate them are impervious to oxygen so there's not going to be any oxidation that happens i mean you, you don't store them out on a dish in the sunlight that doesn't make a lot of sense um in your windowsill but keeping them in a dark bottle just on 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 um at room temperature is fine. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, well, it's been uh, great talking with you. And uh, we got a very good, um, like a masterclass on Omega-3s and Omega-6s. So, uh, yeah, where can people learn more about you and your work? Um, I th think you can... Uh... You can just look up my name and go to my go to just William S. Harris, and you can you can put that in a Google search. Or it'll go to PubMed, and my papers are all there. Um, plus, if you can look at Omega Quant, uh, that's our our company that does the blood testing. OmegaQuant dot com. Um, there's stuff about there, and also we have a I started a fatty acid research institute about four years ago, right? and uh, if you look up the Fatty Acid Research Institute. Uh, there's a lot about me there as well. Nice. Great. Uh, we'll put the links in the show notes. And Thank my you. last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or a habit that you uh, wish you adopted sooner? <laughs> uh, well, if, if I hadn't gotten to Omega-3 when I was, you know, in my, when was it? <clears throat> my early 30s. Um, that's something I'm, I'm glad I did. Um, mm. So I'm 75 now. And still feeling good, still doing work. Um, can I blame it on the omega threes? I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll take it. I've got an omega three index of ten and have had for many oh, years. Wow. So that's uh, something I try to keep up. Mm. Um, probably if I, if anything, I would have started exercising earlier. I mm. was a little bit averse to it for many years, but picked it up the last twenty years. 
Wow, that's good. <laughs> and how much omega threes are you taking for the ten percent? I take uh, I take about fourteen hundred milligrams EPA and DHA per day. Okay. That's in in capsules, well. then eat eat fish periodically. I'm not as often as I should, but pretty often. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks for coming to the podcast. Yeah, and, you're welcome. Yeah, good talking with to, you. Good questions. Yeah. Thank you. Looking forward to more studies in the future. They're they're coming. <laughs> All right. Have a nice day. I'll see you around. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. That's it for this episode. Make sure you check out my new book, The Longevity Leap, on Amazon. I'd also appreciate if you share this episode with a friend or family member. Other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.